Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. God is surely good to his people. It's because of his goodness, his mercy, and his grace. That we're able to assemble here yet again to offer up expressions of praise and adoration and thanksgiving to God for who he is and for everything. There you go, Di. Everything, <laughs> everything that he does. I am particularly uh, pleased to be here today. God allowed me to get back here safely. Uh, I had to go to Los Angeles last week for the Pepperdine lectureships. It was very fruitful, but it was very exhausting. Uh, you know, it takes a lot out of you to... I wasn't even on program. I was just, just being blessed. But uh, So I'm glad to be here today, and I'm glad you're here as we celebrate the goodness of God in our lives. The reason why we're here today is because of God. Uh, we are, this is the day that the Lord has made, Amen. and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah. We know that God has blessed us. Yeah. You see, and even if he decides not to shower down any more blessings in your life, you've been blessed. <laughs> so today we are here to uh, pay tribute to the blessings of God, but also we are here to discuss an area of God's unique being, and that is the area of the, 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 the El Shaddai. God is all-powerful, but you see, God is a nourishing God. Amen. He's able to nourish us, and he allows us to get a glimpse of this nourishing um, comforting capacity of God by giving us mothers. Amen. You see, it's the mothers who really show the softer side of God, if you will. <laughs> it is the mother who helps us to see how God uh, uh, is fully invested in us. It is through the mother's love that we are able to see dimensions and facets of God that we just could not see. Just looking at me, and folk. That's no slight on the brothers. It's a shout out to the mothers. And so we want to give a shout out to them. And all the mothers here, all the women are in this assembly. Understand that you are blessed. And we want to honor you. We want to... Uh, today seek to lift you up to a position that God has had in mind when he created the woman. And so even after the conclusion of this uh, worship experience, we want all the women uh, to stick around for just a little bit. We have a reception that we want to uh, have in your honor as we celebrate I almost said motherhood, but as we celebrate womanhood, you see, it is the virtuous woman who helps us to see the full expression of motherhood. And, and we will do well to take a page out of uh, the book of Proverbs where it begins to, to uh, illuminate and, and magnify uh, those attributes and characteristics of a virtuous woman. Woman, you see, you cannot have a godly mother unless you have a virtuous woman. And so the word of God gives us everything that we need uh, to begin to uh, develop and display those characteristics. And so today, as we talk about the making, the making of a mother, the makings of a mother in our tribute to all the ladies in the house. Is that all right? If you will, turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, the first chapter. And as you turn back into the Old Testament, as you find uh, the book of 1 Samuel, 
we're going to begin to see that it is through this particular woman by the name of Hannah. We're going to use her to show that it was through Hannah. Uh, we use her to point uh, uh, to the makings of a woman of faith. The makings of a woman of faith. And this woman played a, le- a legitimate and even a formative role in the shaping of Israel's history. When you go back and look at the Old Testament, you see a contrast between uh, this woman who was a judge by the name of Deborah, who was able to rule through uh, political clout. She was able to rule through uh, her ability to uh, maneuver and to uh, assemble people for her cause. But while we look at this woman in the period of the judges uh, by the name of Deborah, who was a, 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 a leader, we have to contrast with her, who was a leader in another way. Someone once made a statement, the hand who rocks the cradle rules the world. And it, it was the soft, gentle disposition of Hannah that shaped the very history of Israel. Now, This message is, is too large for uh, one setting. So what I'm going to endeavor to do today is just give you uh, some handles, some handles to, to, to latch hold of and, and embrace what it means to be a woman of faith, a woman who is a woman after God's own heart, but because it's, it's perhaps this woman uh, who, more than any other woman in, in the Old Testament Scriptures, that helps us to see uh, the makings of a mother, the characteristics and the qualifications of a godly mother. It's through this woman. And I know that that there are many women displayed in the Bible. When you go through the Old Testament, you see all these different women uh, who these personalities come out, many who were champions in the faith. I'm reminded of Sarah, who was called the mother of all, what? That was, that was Eve. Sorry about that. That was Eve. <laughs> we, well, you know about Eve, right? That was a woman who was married to what? Adam. She was the mother of all the living. That's what I wanted to say. And then we see Sarah, who was the mother of the Jewish nation. You're able to see Deborah, as I mentioned a moment ago. You're able to see Ruth, Naomi. You see all of these women that the Bible speaks of. But it's this woman. This woman that helps us to understand and to appreciate fully the makings of a mother. And as we go through this, we're celebrating motherhood today. And the significance of motherhood, of womanhood, as well as to highlight the very virtues that shaped the image that God has for all mothers. I I think it would be fitting to say at this time, childbearing. Childbearing in and of itself does not conflate with or does not compare to motherhood. Just as, you know, being able to have offspring or to father a child does not uh, conflate to or does not compare or equate to the idea of fatherhood. There's something more. There's something more critical and more essential. Uh, than simply being able to have a kid. And this woman helps us to appreciate uh, just what that means. And I want us to appreciate. Uh, see, when you appreciate something, then you begin to you value it highly. Just like we ought to value our position in Christ Jesus. Amen. Understanding that Jesus uh, demonstrates that kind of sacrificial love that we all must have. And he, he, he showed that love through dying for us. So therefore, now we are called to show our love, not by dying, uh, but for living, living for him, Amen. which means dying to ourselves, that we may live for him. Amen. And so therefore, we see today uh, in this uh, shout out, if you will, to all the ladies in the house, all the mothers, all the women who are personifying womanhood, 
that God has a great place for you. It's a place of honor. It's a place of esteem. You ought to feel good today about what you have done. And we the men, we ought to let you know how much we appreciate who you are and what you do. And we commend the grace of God to you to continue to strengthen you, uh, to empower you, to enable you to be everything that we need. We need you. Amen. I feel like James Brown right now. It's a man's world, but it wouldn't be nothing. Come on <laughs> Don't make me get started. <laughs> right. Where my cake? <laughs> it wouldn't be nothing without a woman, Amen. a woman or a girl. In this text, the story of Hannah, it presents this sharp contrast, as I said, with Deborah, who was another significant woman from the tribe of Ephraim uh, from the period of the judges. We said that her, Deborah's career um, impacted Israel's uh, society through political clout. We said that. And not only through political clout, but also through judici judicial leadership. She was a leader. She uh, engaged in much prophetic activity. And while all those things are good and great, uh, it was the simple life of Hannah that really impacts us the most. I want to first of all begin by looking at the idea of an appreciation for motherhood. An appreciation for motherhood. Notice, notice, if you will, uh, in this text, the Bible talks about um, the annual festivities and celebrations uh, that were associated with uh, the religious activities of the nation of Israel. So annually they had to have certain uh, religious celebrations. And so it was in the context of them going to Shiloh. Shiloh was the place of worship prior to uh, uh, Jerusalem. They went to Shiloh to engage in the national worship festivities. Well, they had to make sacrifices to the Lord. And the Bible begins to talk about as they were to make this annual track to Shiloh. Uh, there was a certain man who had two wives. One was named Hannah, and the other was named Phineha. Now, Phineha had children, but Hannah, who was perhaps his first wife, just looking at the, the way in which they are listed, she was barren. She didn't have any children. And the Bible talks about Hannah as being a woman of faith in spite of or perhaps even because of her infertility. You see, someone said, you don't miss your water until your well runs dry. And sometimes we who live in this land of abundance and land of plenty, we can take a lot of things for granted. I just came back from Los Angeles where they're, they're, California is having a drought. And now they're beginning to talk about, you know, you can't water your grass and all the stuff you, they used to take for granted, right? You know, you can get fined. My brother told me, Ronnell, he said he was out watering his grass. And the guy from the water department drove up and parked and came out and said, don't you know I can, give you a, I can fine you for that? You know, he rolled up his little water hose. <laughs> he rolled his water hose up, <laughs> turned off the water and went on back in the house. But you see, now they are now beginning to appreciate what we take for granted. And sometimes, even in this text, we can see how, how Hannah, God was working on her, even through her barrenness, even through her uh, uh, infertility, if you will, heightening her desire for a child. The one woman who had many children, the Bible says, uh, she began to taunt Hannah. It kind of reminds me. It kind of reminds me of the situation uh, with Sarah, who was childless. And as a result of that, uh, 
her handmaid, Hagar, uh, began to taunt her, began to speak scornfully toward her. And in those situations, we are tempted to take matters in our own hands. But I want to really deal with this woman, uh, Hannah, because in her childlessness, she yearned for children. She was crying out for uh, the privilege of motherhood. Even in the midst of the scorn from her rival, the Bible says uh, her, her co-wife was her tormentor. He, she was ridiculing her, and I'm sure her children perhaps chimed in as well. See, circumstances, circumstances are designed to strengthen your faith. You who are even under the sound of my voice right now, there are some circumstances in your life. There's some stuff going on in your life. I'm not going to try to enumerate what the God I don't know. You know some stuff about you that I don't know. Don't think I read your mail. Don't think I peeped in your window. Because in the human experience, we all deal with circumstances. So we all go through something. But those circumstances are, are, are for the purpose of strengthening your faith. I love James because James says, I want you to, when you, when you go through some stuff, you know, when you got some problems in your life, he says, I want you to have the right attitude toward the stuff, all the mess, all the, the junk in, 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 that comes into your, into your life. He says, now, 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 if you, I want to tell you something. Come here, come here. Come here. This will bless you if you're not careful. It's not what happens to you that determines you. It's not what goes on and what happens in your life that defines your life. It's how you respond. It's how you handle the stuff, the mess that comes in your life. Do you, not, do you not know that Satan brings certain things in your life that he wants that to tear you up? He wants your life to be so fuddled and so uh, dis dysfunctional that you may say, well, I'm going to come to church once I get all this together. Yeah. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah, right. I got a few things to take care of, but when I get, when I get those things taken care of, I'll be back. You missed it. It's right over your head. You see, uh, another little hint, hint, clue, clue. There is too much stuff for you to handle. That's right. You will never get your plate clean. That's right. You will never get it all together where you can come back to God. Do you not understand that God is using? He used providentially. He's using those things to strengthen you. He's using those things to draw you closer to him, to depend on him. Knowing that you can't do it by yourself. Amen. Knowing that you are inadequate and inept to accomplish the very purpose of, the, of God without God. Right. All this, this, this nonsense about, well, when I get this together, when I get all my ducks in a row, then I'm coming. Please. That's too much stuff. God is using it. So James says, count it all joy. Enjoy when you encounter the various trials in your life, Amen. knowing that God in the midst of it. See, this is what we need to learn how to do, church. Learn how to say, well, God, what are you up to now? Amen. What are you doing now? Don't say, why you're doing this? Why me? Right. Say, God, how are you using this to, be, to build me up? Yeah. How are you using this to make me a better person? How, are you, how am I going to be a better Christian as a result of these things that I'm going through? Amen. What are you up to right now, God? Right now. I want to know. So we need to be able to look past our circumstances and see the providential hand of God. And therefore, I rejoice even in my affliction. This woman, this woman was sorely oppressed. I can see uh, the anguish of her spirit. I want you ima to imagine this woman right now. Every year they would go down uh, to the feast. 
And then after the sacrifices were made, um, uh, the husband would bring a certain portion to his wives. And uh, now I, 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 I will have to say this because in my study of this, I notice what it says here. Um, somewhere in about verse number, I'm going to start verse number five, I guess. Um, four, I guess. <laughs> um, and it was time that Elkanah, Elkanah uh, offered, he gave to Peniha, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters. But unto Hannah, he gave a worthy or double portion. Now stop right there. The NIV and the King James are very, very generous in this. I guess they were putting, portraying him a certain way. But you see, meat was not really a, an everyday staple in the Jewish diet. So it was on certain times. And then also, the portion would be given based on the number of children. So there's another rendering of this passage that says he only gave her one portion. I'm more inclined to favor that opposed to how the NIV and the King James puts it out here. The point is, the point is uh, that even that was cause for embarrassment. Notice the text. The text said that um, when they were there eating, verse number seven, and it says, uh, year by year, uh, when she went up to the house of the Lord, uh, that her rival provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. So I want you to not just look at the words right here, but I want you to kind of look with your feelings right now. I want you to feel, I want you to feel what's taking place here. This woman could not even celebrate, could not even uh, uh, uh. I don't know if you're feeling me on this, Come on now. but there's sometimes in your life Come on. when sorrow seems to get a grip on you, and everyone can be laughing around you, everyone can be having a good time, right. but whatever has a grip on you will not allow you to join in the celebration. Right. Smokey Robinson says, people say I'm alive for the party because I tell a joke or two. Is that right? <laughs> Although I may be laughing loud and hearty, deep inside, y'all join in with me. <laughs> he said, if you look closely, you're able to trace the tracks of my tears. The tracks of my tears. This woman could not engage in the, the festive celebration because of the anguish of her soul. Because, God, why have you closed up my womb? Why have you not allowed me to experience, uh, experience the beauty and the very dynamic of motherhood? Sometimes uh, we need a heightened appreciation for we can really discharge our duties as mothers. And so in this situation, we understand that the Lord sometimes engineers social tragedies. When you go through a tragedy, don't you know that sometimes that's God doing that? God, through his providential, his providential uh, will, allows us to experience some things that make us even say, why, God? Why have you allowed me to go through this? And God may have been the very one who's allowing these situations to take place in your life. Why? For you to have a heightened appreciation uh, and dependence on him. Sometimes we think that we can do it all by ourselves until we get a phone call from the doctor. Uh, until we get uh, some kind of emergency situation that, that, that lets us know that you're not in control. The certain things that you are powerless uh, to uh, affect the outcome. And this woman realized that there was nothing that she could do about it. And so she cried out in anguish. But the Lord is working in those situations. He's engineering through your social uh, tragedy 
Why? Because he's able to carry them out. That the work of God might be displayed. Remember over in John chapter 9? Over in John chapter 9, when they encountered a, woman, a man, this man was blind from birth. You remember that? And they begin to rationalize amongst themselves. Everybody was talking about why. I think it's interesting that we always got some commentary on some stuff, right? <laughs> Folk go through some situations, girl, don't you know what happened to someone? And yeah, they must have been, uh, they must have been out there, you know, doing this, that, and the other. You don't have a clue. That's right. <laughs> they said they came to Jesus to settle the matter. They said, uh, who sinned? You get that? Who sinned? See, sometimes, uh, Hannah, it may not be because you sinned. Sometimes you go through some things, it may not have anything to do with you. Some things, things can happen around you, and they impact you. Uh, see, that whole theology of the law of, uh, of retribution, that's what was the problem with Job and them. They embraced the theory or the, the doctrine uh, of retribution. In other words, uh-huh, Job, I'm looking at you. I see all them souls on your head. I see all the stuff that happened to you. What have you done? Go ahead and repent, for we all know that you don't sin. That wouldn't be happening unto you, to you unless you sin, right? So they asked Jesus, who has sinned that this man be born blind? Was it the mother? Was it the father? Some dad, someone in the family tree? He said, no, 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 it's not about that. This situation is so that the glory of God Amen. might be revealed to you. Right. Sometimes God puts you through some situations and, and puts some calamities in your life that you may display the glory of God. See, when you go through some situations, when you're tested by life's circumstances and you go through that, God is glorified. And when you don't go through some things, when you don't do what you're supposed to do, when you don't live the way God wants you to do, you not know you're robbing God? The Bible said, would a man rob God? See, I ain't talking about your pocketbook right now. Sometimes we rob God uh, by simply failing to do God's will. Failing to emerge through trying and, and troublesome times in a way that brings glory to him. Amen. We are cast down, but we're not broken. Sometimes we find ourselves, our continents may be falling, but we get up and we keep on keeping on. Why? Because God gives us the strength. He will not give us more than we can bear. Amen. But even with the temptations we face, he's able to give us an exit ramp, a way of escape. And then when we do that, we give glory to God. Amen. And so... It's, it's through this, according to human tragedy, uh, that we can properly evaluate uh, the situation that God is doing, what God is bringing forth in our lives. You see, it's the end result. The end result is really important. Sometimes we never get to a favorable end result. Why? Because as we're going through in, in the middle of the race, in the middle of the trial, in the middle of the circumstance, we start cussing. We go back to drinking. I shouldn't say back to drinking. <laughs> we, we start, we engage in behavior. There's unbecoming to a Christian. And we, 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 we cop out with that Flip Wilson. We, we use Flip Wilson phrase. What the devil made me do it? Have you ever asked someone, how you doing? They say, well, the devil's busy. I mean, tell me something I don't know. See, that's a cop out. The devil's busy simply means that, you know, we are succumbing. We're succumbing to the influences of Satan, even in our, in our daily walk. We, we, we begin to demonstrate or declare who really has sway over our lives. You know, yes, the devil's busy. The Bible says that. The only thing is, Christians are supposed to be busier. That's right now. I mean, that's what my, my Bible says. You know, we are the ones who ought to be working on our soul salvation. Right. We are the ones who, who put Satan and his kingdom on high alert. But we're the ones who are saying, Satan, Satan, oh devil, we're going to tear your kingdom down. We're going to pray it down. We're going to preach it down. We're going to love it down. We're going to shake the very foundation of hell itself because we are the church of Christ. Ah, but when we allow those little circumstances to knock us down, to take our gaze off Jesus, and we begin to sink. We rob God of his glory. Notice, notice in this text, we see her barrenness gave her a heightened appreciation for motherhood. And it also strengthened uh, and fortified her desire uh, for motherhood. 
Notice, and again, we've already talked about a little bit of uh, the idea of uh, her weeping and her uh, crying out, not able to eat, not able to enjoy uh, because of the grieving of her heart, what was going on in the situation. And her husband said, you know, aren't I better than 10 sons? I'm sure he was trying to edify her. He said, you got me, baby. I got you. You got me. It kind of reminds me of Rachel, who was also barren, by the way, for a time. And it was when she, uh, her rivals, her counterparts, had an accumulation of 10 sons. <laughs> it takes me back to that, you know, that, that analogy there. He said, aren't I better than 10 sons? In other words, aren't I, I'm all you need? But see, I just want to say this to you. Although he may try to have comforted her, there are some situations that the only comfort you can get is from the Lord. Amen. You see, she was feeling down in the very bowels of her gut this uh, yearning. The effects of this discomfort had outward manifestations. You could just look at her. Have you ever looked at somebody and you say, baby, what's wrong? You can see that something's out of character. See, that's what the body of Christ is really supposed to be all about. See, we love each other so much, and we are so uh, uh, intrinsically woven together. We're so connected that if something's wrong with you, I ought to be able to know something's wrong. If something's wrong with me, you ought to know. Well, Brother Mary, what's going on? Something seems to be wrong. Well, that's nothing, and you ought to shit, give me by my collar and say, don't lie to me. Let's talk. That's the kind of aggressive, radical love that we need to have. Come on now. You see, well, I won't let you get away with that. That's right. I'm not, no, I love you too much to allow you to engage and continue and persist in certain behavior that I know is detrimental to your well-being. And if I don't say anything about it, see, sometimes we say a whole lot about it to somebody else. Right. We <laughs> see, you know, you know I like music, right? I'm not going to get into a whole lot of this, but the emotions had a song that don't ask my neighbor. <laughs> don't ask my friends I hang around. If you want to know something, come to me. Sometimes we need to go to one another and help one another. Amen. Don't go all around the bush talking about it to everybody else. You need to go and talk to that person. They need you at that hour. And so, and so we notice uh, not only the effects, she had, an, she had uncontrollable tears. Uncontrollable tears. See, the, the tragedy that impacts a mother's heart is much different than that same tragedy how it impacts, impacts somebody else. Amen. It's the mother's love uh, that uh, make her stay up all night long when dad gone to sleep. <laughs> Brother, I'm just trying to keep it real. It's something... It's something about uh, the heart of womanhood. There are the comfort uh, that you can't receive from anybody else. You can only get it from God, and God uses mothers to help us to see, and to especially grandmothers, who's the mother of the mother of the mother, uh, who has a, that, that, that uncanny ability uh, to, pray, uh, to pray you out of, out of prison. To pray, even though you're going through some stuff in your life, that the reason why you are not incarcerated today is because if you were acting a fool, if I can use that word, as you were living a life of rebellion against God, when every time the helicopters uh, were going around, uh, the mother and grandmother couldn't sleep at night. I'm told of a story about a man uh, who was in prison and uh, talked to his granny and on the phone, and she said, well, I'm so glad you were in jail. And first of all, he was taken aback by that. You know, wait, 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 wait. I was going to ask you to, I was going to ask you to put the house up, take out a second on the house. Uh huh. I was hoping, hint, hint, clue, clue. I was hoping you was getting ready to get me out. And she said, "See, when you out on the streets, I couldn't sleep at night. And every time the helicopters went around, and, and every time I saw the lights flashing and the siren, I couldn't sleep because I thought it was you." I thought it was you, killing somebody or being killed. But now, now, that you are, now that you are incarcerated, 
I'm going to hang up this phone now, son. And I'm going to sleep. And by the way, don't make no more collect calls. <laughs> but you see, it's the prayer. The prayer of the mother. The intercessory prayer. Uh, that has gotten us out of a lot of jams. And guess what? We thought we did it on our own. Oh, uh, Gina, you're so naive. You, you so much missed it. You see, this passage also teaches that true power is to be found not in one's position in society. Because now we're ready to make a transition now. The Bible says she rose up. Couldn't eat. She left the feast. And she went to the place of worship. She went to the place of worship with a, with, in, the, in the anguish of heart, broken spirit. She went into the temple. And the Bible says she began to pray. She began to pray, not just pray, but she prayed earnestly. She prayed continuously. She was in the temple. Uh, now the Bible says that uh, while she was there, in verse 9, Hannah rose up after, uh, and they had eaten in Shiloh. Remember, she couldn't eat, right? And after she had drunk a little bit, uh, uh, now Eli, the priest, sat upon the seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, and when you go back and read this, you, be you begin to find that this prayer is one of the most significant prayers about, of any other woman, especially in the Old Testament. She begins to use uh, the Lord of hosts. She begins to refer to Jehovah in, 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 in terms that others would not even dare utter. She began to appeal to him. She began to say, um, make vows to him, beseeching him that if he would only open her womb, if he would allow her to have a child, I will uh, give him back to you. Now, it was in this context that as she was praying, the Bible says she was, it was one of those guttural prayers. It was not a lot of fluency of speech. and eloquence of the ceremonial prayer, the lofty, oh, no. It was one of those gut kind of prayers. It's one of those, what the Bible says in the chapter of Romans, how there are certain, sometimes there are certain groanings that we cannot even utter. She was, her lips were moving, but no words were coming out. And, 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 and Eli was watching as he observed this. You know, see, now, you see, and that's why I was getting ready to say that um, true power is not found in one's position in society, but in one's posture before God. Do y'all get that? See, Eli had a certain position. He was, he was, you go back and do your research, you'll find that, you know, he was too old to function in his capacity. His sons were now functioning half nine Phinehas. His sons, those, those, those jokers. I say that because they were some wicked guys. And, 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 and even Eli, uh, Eli had some responsibility in that. But he is down in the position he's looking at, and he sees her, uh, you know, doing whatever she's doing. And he concluded, he concluded that she was uh, behaving herself in a way that was unseemly. You see, according to this motif of appearance versus reality, he looked at the outward appearance and drew some faulty conclusions. He looked at her, you know, going through these expressions of anguish of soul, and he began to say, perhaps maybe she's drunk. And he's trying to defend the integrity of the temple. Eli, who possessed spiritual competence because of his office, was in fact a spiritual bum Come on. Come on now. because of his office and position. He had certain spiritual, you know, uh, clout. But when the rubber met the road, spiritually he was, uh, he was the real powerhouse in this narrative, was this socially impotent woman, socially unempowered woman, a woman, first of all, a childless woman, second of all, 
a childless woman who was married to another who had many kids who continued to just push her down the social ladder. So therefore, the one who was the priest, the one who was supposed to be, you know, all of that in comparison to this woman, she was the real powerhouse in this narrative. You see, uh, Hannah alone understood the true power of individuals' faith in the Lord. Because unlike, unlike uh, some of her predecessors, unlike Sarah, who was faced with a situation where she was childless, and she simply said, okay, uh, God, you've made some covenant promises to, to Abraham, and you have not delivered on those promises, so I'm going to help you out, God. See, sometimes, see, she circumvented the faith process, tried to go around the corner on God. And so she gave uh, Abram her handmaiden to go into. Sarah didn't go out like that. See, she began to petition God. I want to talk about the petition of motherhood. See, Hannah, Hannah was a woman of faculty. She had good sense. She had good sense. She knew that God alone was able to address her situation. Amen. So unlike Sarah, she didn't go try to help God out. She didn't try to come up with a, another devised plan uh, for God. I think God knows how to be God. I think he, God is God all by himself. He don't, if he needs an answer to a question, you think he asked me? <laughs> Are you? <laughs> God knows how to be God. He's been, he's been God long enough. Notice she did not circumvent the faith process like Sarah. Nor did she uh, notice uh, she made an intimate plea. Oh, Lord God. She began to plead. And, and I think this is what set mothers apart. Mothers, because God has so wired you to be feeling folk. Is that right? See, sometimes men try to logically and cognitively solve problems. And we want, to, we want to fix everything. My wife would come home from work uh, and she want to talk about this and that and the other and I began to tell her how to fix the situation. She just wanted to talk. She just wanted to vent. And I'm, try, I'm, trying, I'm trying to help her out. I'm trying to, well, baby, what, what you need to do is and we get into it. <laughs> where, where my wife? Where my wife? <laughs> But I was wrong. <laughs> I, was, I didn't understand how the woman was wired by God to be an emotional person, to be a feeling person. She just wanted to talk. <laughs> See, I already, I already told you what she had to do five minutes ago. Why are, you, why are we still talking about that? Move out of the way the game's on. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to say. See, a woman is able to feel and is able to express herself emotionally. Amen. Let me say something here. I might as well say sometimes, sometimes the men, even in your intimacy, you want to get to the bottom line. You want to, and a woman, she may want to just, just hold me, baby. And you hold and look at your watch. <laughs> how, we gonna, how long are we going to do this? <laughs> <laughs> Father's Day is coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she made an unconditional commitment. An unconditional commitment. God, if you give me this child, I'm going to give him back to you. And see, that's really where this lesson goes. We need to be able to, if, if you want to be a good mother or a good father, you need to be able to raise children up that you can give back to the Lord. Amen. I think that's where the rubber meets the road. Can you give your child uh, to the Lord? Unlike, there was a guy, I forget his name, in, in the Old Testament. He came from a battle. Uh, help me out, some of these scholars out there. He came from a battle. He was victorious. And he said, the first, uh, I'm going to make a battle and make a sacrifice. The first thing that I see when we enter back into our land, I'm going to sacrifice it to the Lord. Uh, you know the first thing he saw coming? It was his daughter. His daughter coming running to help celebrate the victory of her daddy. He had made a vow to God. 
And you know he gave that daughter as a burnt sacrifice to God. Whereas Hannah gave her son as a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. He made a very presumptuous vow. See, she had had a thought out vow. She knew exactly what she wanted. And she, she talked to the God and she said, give me a child and I'll give him back to you. If you want to be a good mother or father, rear your children in such a way that they are offered up as an offering back to God. Amen. In terms of you helping them to live a life that is consecrated and dedicated to God. As we close, I just want to say uh, this passage suggests that spiritual power triumphs over social power. She was socially powerless individual, and, but she was transformed into uh, a social institution through faith in the Lord. Again, Samuel, one of the most prolific judges of Israel. You see, it's the commitment to motherhood. It's the commitment to motherhood where we find our blessings. It's a commitment to Christ that we find our blessings. Amen. Notice in verse 18, the Bible says three things. After she had this encounter with Eli, she said, no, Eli, you got it wrong. I'm, no, I'm pouring my heart out to the Lord. He eventually said, well, you'll go your way, and may the God of heaven bless you in your request. And then in verse number 18, as we conclude, she said, let thy handmaiden find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. Can you trust God today to receive his answer, trust in his promises, and go away with a heart of gladness? If you go away with a heart of gladness, it's going to show up in your disposition. See, sometimes we leave church even, but we don't leave with a heart of gladness. We leave church, but we don't, we don't leave away, we don't go away with a, a lifted countenance. See, therefore, our witness about the brilliance and the glory of God is compromised. God wants to be glorified in us. Amen. So when we walk away, we need to be able to have a heart of gladness. Amen. Our countenance should be lifted, knowing that God is able to keep all of his promises, knowing that God is good to deliver on whatever he says, so mothers today understand that God loves you. Let me put it another way. God loves us, so he gave, us to you, gave you to us. So I want to celebrate all you ladies today. Happy Mother's Day. Be blessed today. I want all the men to give them a shout out. Give them a round of applause today. <laughs> For it's in the spirit, the spirit of Hannah, that we see the makings of a mother. It's in that spirit that we see, we see the love of God. For the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he did the same. He gave his only son as a sacrifice. That through that sacrifice, see, it's the sacrifice that becomes the, the fodder or the, the fuel from which covenant blessings flow. When Abraham entered and received covenant promises, he made a sacrifice. When Jacob wrestled all night long uh, with God, uh, at the end of that, he received the blessing and he did mud. He made a sacrifice. If you've been blessed by God, you ought to be doing what? You ought to make a sacrifice. And it's through the sacrifice, through the, even, when, even when, when you find me stretched out, In front of everybody. Know, know that I'm confident that I've made a sacrifice. Sometimes it's the sacrifice of your life that results in the life of somebody else. You ought to make a sacrifice today. You ought to see uh, the vow of commitment that Hannah made. You, whatever you give me, God, I don't care what it is in life. If God has blessed you with whatever, you ought to be able to give it back to God. I'm going to sacrifice to you, God, because you have blessed me. She gave a living sacrifice. You need to be a living sacrifice to God. If you're here today and you're not a member of the body of Christ, 
You're not even uh, sure uh, that if God were to come back right now to shut this whole thing down, will you be ready to meet him? That's the pivotal question. You need to have your calling and election sure. You need to understand that God has made the ultimate sacrifice for you. So how will you respond today? If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he died uh, that you may live, he was buried and rose again on the third day, triumphant over death. He took the sting. He took the sting ah, out of death. He neutralized the impact of sin because he took the law, which gave power to sin. He took the law out of the way. And so now we live by grace. If you want to receive the benefits and the blessings of being a child of God, it simply comes by responding to the gospel invitation.